Starting 180 years ago and going all the way to today, we're gonna to cover the 10 biggest moments in the history of the camera. This is the Picture This Photography Podcast. And this episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a website store or just a portfolio for your gorgeous, gorgeous pictures, you can go to squarespace.com and get a free 14-day trial. And if you decide to go live with that portfolio, you can use the coupon code CHELSEA and get 10% off. Go to squarespace.com slash CHELSEA. Thanks, Squarespace. So... The first thing we want to talk about, let's go back to 1839, 180 years ago, to the daguerreotype. Why was this important? Well, first of all, if you don't know what a daguerreotype is, it is a printed photo on a silver-plated piece of copper. It's polished like a mirror, and then they could actually print a photo. So for the first time, the photo is a transportable item, and people went wild for it. They got their pictures taken. You could do landscape photography with it and have this metal print. Because it was silver, it would tarnish. It would easily be ruined if you touched it, so they were kept in these cases. Maybe you've seen them before. And it was a new format where you could print a photo, but it was so expensive, it was only accessible to the very wealthy. And you basically had to be a chemist to do it. it was yeah, really oh, complicated. you had to work with mercury vapor, which, not good. And so it was not accessible money-wise, but also it was just very difficult to do. Not it's, a simple thing. But still so much more realistic than the alternative, which was a painting. Well, they were actually gorgeous. If you see them, they were sharp. The they daguerreotypes. Were, yeah, they yeah. were beautiful. Yeah, they are pretty amazing. And people still do that whole process today. I would love to have one done. Then we jump to the year 1900, which is the year they introduced the Brownie. This is kind of the first snapshot camera. The yeah. first consumer camera, the first camera you could pick up and take a family vacation and actually record it. But it, do you need mercury vapor? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You don't need Dang. mercury vapor, but you could still get some. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's actually shot on film. And, you know, this is the camera that launched Ansel Adams and every photographer of the era. And it's so good that we had the introduction of the consumer camera because that's something that has never died down. Photography should be in the hands of the everyday man. And we have a picture of it there, and it's pretty big. It's a very simple box, if you haven't seen one before. It's not like a traditional camera now where you could very easily hold it. You don't hold it up to your eye. It's bulky, but it's accessible. Let's go to 1927 where Leica adopts 35 millimeter film. It's a standard film, and they want to put it into a smaller format. The prototype was the idea of being able to take landscape photography with 35 millimeter film, and especially for hikers, if they're out and about, they could transport this small camera. They could use small film to make big pictures. That was the idea. So they knew that they needed extremely sharp optics because they'd need this small 35 millimeter film to blow up into a large, sharp picture. They made, I, I think, like 20 or 30 of them. They gave them to photographers to go try, and some of them didn't like it. Mm -hmm. They did not like the small format, but... Leica, fortunately for all of us, decided to go ahead with the 35 millimeter camera anyway, thus popularizing this small format. And I think Leica was the most forward thinking because they had the idea that you should be able to take your camera anywhere with you, and it really changed photography. And this is still the format we use on what we call full frame cameras today. Like it yeah. has been the standard for 92 years. Yeah. That's amazing. And everyday people were seeing these pictures in their magazines and newspapers, even though they couldn't afford a Leica. The idea was becoming really, really popular. And so shortly thereafter, we start to see some companies in Japan, like Canon, making complete ripoffs of these cameras. They're literally ca copying the mount and they're copying all of the optics and they're starting to sell them, at least in Japan, at a lower price point. We ha actually have an entire podcast on a lot of these separate companies, Leica, Nikon, Canon. So if you want us to go into more details, you can go look up our older podcasts on those and find out a lot of, I think, very fascinating details. Yeah, it's cool if you like cameras or history. So we have these little kind of startup companies ripping off Leica gear, and then something terrible, one of the worst things in human history happens, which is World War II. And Japan 
needs to mobilize their workforce and militarize everything. So they just shut down all factories. And Canon is completely shut down. Nikon, they repurpose it, and Nikon is now making telescopes for the Japanese Navy. After Japan surrenders, the Allies occupy Japan. And so now you have mostly service men staying in a foreign country almost as tourists because there's not active war going on. Yeah. And they think it's so cool. They're seeing this completely different part of the world, like, for example, Tokyo, for the first time. And they want to capture the memories and send them back to their families and just remember it. So they want to buy cameras. And so these little camera companies like Nikon and Canon, they start their factories back up and they think, we'll sell some of these Leica ripoff cameras to these servicemen. And the servicemen love them. They're not the best made cameras or anything, but yeah. the camera companies start getting some money now so they can up their business a little bit. They have some help from their new relationship with the United States, and they start learning how to work with Americans and other parts of the world as well as market gear to them. And that's really a turning point. And that's kind of why even today all the dominant camera companies are Japanese. It comes out of this allied occupation of Japan following World War II. And I just think it's so crazy that World War II is what defines the camera industry today, so many years later. Absolutely. Who would have thought this terrible thing going on in the war would have shaped Nikon into figuring out optics so that they could make the optics for the Navy? And then here we are still valuing that optic technology today. And you know why it's so overlooked? If you look on Nikon's website, they have a whole history, but they just completely skip World War II. because yeah, not a really great time. Well, right. Culturally, we don't like to talk about it. Yeah. So Nikon and Canon have mostly just been ripping Leica off. But in 1959, Nikon makes a new mount. Instead of being a rangefinder, this is an SLR. The SLR stands for Single Lens Reflex. That's different from the rangefinders that Leica was making. With a rangefinder, in most cameras of the time, you actually had two lenses. One lens that you looked through to line your picture and to focus, and the other lens went from the lens to the actual film. And those two things were linked together in the rangefinders, but they could become unlinked. They could become imperfectly linked. So every year or so, you'd have to send your Leica back to Germany and get it serviced. And maybe if you didn't, if you didn't get a service in time, then stuff would slip out of focus and you'd ruin like three or four rolls of film because everything would just be out of focus. The SLR, because it had a single lens that you shot through and looked through, if you saw it in focus, you would be in focus. What you saw was what you got. Nikon didn't invent the SLR, but they popularized it with their F-mount. And they came in at an inexpensive price point, less than what Leica was doing at the time. And so photojournalists, people in the public eye, latched onto it right away. And instead of having Leicas on their shoulder, now they had Nikon F bodies on their shoulders. They were shooting the Olympics with them. They were off in foreign countries recording the Vietnam War and so many other important events. And it made Nikon the number one camera company of the time, despite having all these camera companies trying to compete with them. And to this day, Nikon is still producing cameras and lenses for the F mount. Coming up after the break, we're going to be talking about the rise of digital photography, how that impacted photography, and also how America strikes back. But first, let's talk about Squarespace. You probably haven't heard of it. I'm guessing you never heard of Squarespace. Well, you can make your own website, store, or portfolio on Squarespace. In fact, I just updated my portfolio yesterday. I wanted all new pictures, and it only took me about a half hour to get a new template put in place and replace almost all of my pictures. It was so fast and easy, even someone as ADD as me can do it. Oh, I didn't know you changed your template too. Yeah, isn't it so nice you can go for a completely new mm -hmm. look and reinvent yourself without having to be like a webmaster. Yeah, and I also like it because I do have an Instagram, I have a Facebook. It all tends to be chronological so people don't see my best work first. With my Squarespace portfolio, I make sure when people go to my website, they see the pictures that I want them to see first because I know they'll judge me by my worst picture. That's how it works. If you wanna try your own Squarespace, you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You can get a 14 day free trial for free. No credit cards needed, just try it. See if you find it as easy as I do. And if you decide to go live with your free website and buy it, you can get 10% off with the coupon code Chelsea. Thanks Squarespace. 
This brings us to 1987. Yes, when Canon develops the EOS and has this new feature, electronic autofocus. So up until then, Nikon has been like up ahead in the race. Canon and Nikon are always going back and forth. Then Canon comes out with this new autofocus and it's a game changer and they're marketing it heavily. They have Andre Agassi in their commercials. Like, whoa, remember him? He was super cool. And they're just pushing it hard. And it is the feature that is selling Canon cameras at this point. So they make this leapfrog jump and they're up ahead with their new technology. We still use digital autofocus. Where would we be without it? Yeah, and Nikon makes the choice to stick with their old mount. And they're both still using those same mounts today, but Nikon mm, was always a little bit behind in some fields, and part of it was just Canon's choice to ditch their old mount. Now, let's go forward to the year 2000, which was such a significant year for me because I was in IT and I was a nerd, and we were scared to death that Y2K was going to destroy the entire world. But you know what really had... The hearts of nerds at that time were little yeah. crappy digital cameras. <laughs> I was shooting film and scanning film and sharing it online, and all the digital cameras to me at the time seemed awful. But more and more, people were starting to pick them up, and I think a couple of years later, I picked up my first digital camera, which was a Canon D60, and it took all my existing lenses, and I didn't have to scan film anymore. And we saw digital cameras continue to be popular as the internet became more and more popular. We had things like MySpace. I know you had a MySpace. Yeah, heck yeah, I had a MySpace. And you'd want to put some good pictures of yourself up there and make yourself look cool and sure help to have a digital camera. I had a Vivitar, which if I had to guess had one megapixel, it was the worst looking photo I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> but I still used it. And you could sample the photos on the back, but it took forever. They were very small. Mm -hmm. It was a new way to go. If you wanted your picture online, if you wanted to share your photos with your friends, you had to go digital. And we, there was no one particular year when digital took over. But in 2007, something really big did happen. This was the introduction of the first iPhone. And at the time, we had like little flip phones. Like my Motorola StarTac, which I was so proud of because it was so small. And you could text by pushing the numbers. But this one was different. It had a big full-color touchscreen and a 2-megapixel camera on the back. And that camera was so bad. I know, me and my nerd friends, we had an iPhone and we were so excited. But the pictures were terrible. But then something happened. Apple had an app store. And third parties could start to write apps that would use this camera hardware. And then you could take those pictures and upload them to websites and web apps. And you could do some editing. And this all kind of evolved over the period of a few years. But it's something that would permanently and forever change the way people took and shared pictures. It came to redefine what photography was. Instead of, I'll develop this roll of film and then show my family a slideshow or a photo album, instead of being, oh, I'll take this memory card and load them on my computer and upload them to MySpace. It was instantaneous sharing and incredible flexibility. And now the iPhone is still the most popular camera in the world. And I think it's significant that this reintroduces America to the camera market as one of the camera leaders. We don't think of an iPhone as a camera, but that's what it is. And America had been wiped out of the camera industry. You know, we had GoPro kind of giving it a shot at this time. But Apple comes in and just wrecks everything. So the iPhone becomes more and more popular from 2007 on. We see regular digital cameras, conventional cameras peak around 2012. And then since then, we've had just a steep fall off as everybody switches to iPhones and other smartphones because of their many different advantages. In 2016, we start to see this technology go computational. So maybe uh, the camera phones weren't as good as a regular camera, but then they get two lenses on the iPhone and they're able to start using those two lenses to make the photos appear more like a DSLR. Suddenly you're able to use the computational power to create bokeh, the fake bokeh in the background and have some background blur that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get without a large traditional lens. So they're taking the limitations of this small camera put in a phone and they're working around them. 
Yeah, this caught me off guard. Even as somebody who was studying the industry at the time, people would say, oh, are these camera phones ever going to take over real cameras? And I'd say, no, there's no way they can simulate big glass. You will always need big glass to take these pictures. And then the geniuses at Apple are like, let's do some depth mapping. We can actually compute this. And it's still not perfect. Even with my new iPhone 11 Pro Max, whatever it's called, I took some pictures just yesterday in the Foca is not great. Can I argue with you for yeah. a moment? Yeah, please. You actually did predict that it would go computational. You didn't not see it coming. You said, oh, they'll go computational and they'll, they'll work around it. Okay, maybe I'm underestimating myself. You are. I mean, have you ever had someone make such a nice argument? No, you? I appreciate that. I know. We should argue like this all the time. I'll try. No, I won't. <laughs> so suddenly these smartphones are doing things that people didn't think were possible and the reasons you need to pick up a full big camera continue to decrease and then just last week google announces the pixel 4 and one of the pictures they use to promote it is a picture of the milky way that's one of the things you needed a full big camera and a big huge like fast wide angle lens to do now no. you can pull the smartphone out of your pocket and handhold it this one surprised me because we had been out under beautiful stars with a friend and he pulled out his phone and wondered why I couldn't take a picture. And I said, you can't do that. You need a real camera to do that. Wow. Google proved me wrong. Yeah, they can basically simulate really long exposures with this tiny little lens. They can gather enough light. They, it, it takes so long that the stars actually move through the sky, but the smartphone's smart enough to figure that out, to separate the moving stars from the static background and stitch everything together and make it look beautiful. And the rise of computational photography is going to open up so many doors. So many people will be able to experience something like astrophotography without having to spend thousands of dollars. They'll be able to use the thing that they already have with them. And I'm so excited that it's going to open up exploring the universe to just about everybody in the near future at least as it continues to become popular and continues to get better 2018 we'll say this is the year of mirrorless because this is when canon and nikon finally look at sony and they say all right we have to have our mirrorless cameras out now and it becomes widely adopted all of the major players have a mirrorless camera and mirrorless sales are starting to outpace dslrs so now we're just looking into the future from here where that mirrorless technology will take us and if it will be able to outpace phone technology since that's growing so rapidly. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because you know we covered when Nikon passed Leica and then when Canon passed Nikon and this mirrorless change requires everybody to have a whole new lens mount, which is an opportunity for everybody to switch camera systems. Yeah, And already it's not... Canon and Nikon battling anymore, but now it's like Sony and Canon, and Nikon's fallen to a third place, and we're still not quite sure how it's going to unfold, because Canon's putting up a good fight against Sony, who put all their chips into mirrorless much earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an exciting point in history. Ten years from now, we'll be looking back on this and explaining how everything unfolded. But right now, the future's not completely clear. I'd like to hear what you think the biggest moments of photography and camera have been. Uh, so write a comment down below. Did we miss something? What did we get wrong? I want to know what you think the future is because we've said before DSLRs might be dead and it was like, Tony, you blew up the, the photography community with that statement, but it's a real possibility. Perhaps mirrorless will take over and not as many people will be using DSLRs. It's possible they'll stick around in tandem and both be relevant. But what do you think is gonna happen? Will phones wipe everyone out? Smartphones and cameras won't be as popular? Tell us in the comments. And I, of course, I wanna take a moment to thank Squarespace for making this podcast possible. If you want to start your 14-day free trial, you can do that today for free. Did I mention no monies? You don't need it. You just need a few minutes of your time. And you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Thanks. See you guys. I did that. That reminded me of David Letterman. He always used to throw the pencils at the camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>